Start with Ohio, where J.D. Vance is now the Republican nominee for Senate in that state. Vance, who was a big critic of Donald Trump back in 2016, won a tight race in the primary after Trump publicly backed him about three weeks ago. He will face Democratic Ohio Congressman Tim Ryan this fall for the seat that's being vacated by retiring Senator Rob Portman. Congressman Ryan will be our guest in just a few minutes. Meanwhile, in Ohio, gubernatorial race, Republican Mike DeWine secured the nomination in his bid for re-election. Former Dayton Mayor Nan Whaley easily won the Democratic nomination for governor. And one more notable race in Ohio, the rematch between an establishment Democrat and a progressive left candidate. And for the second time in a year, the mainstream Democrat Congresswoman Chantel Brown defeated former state senator Nina Turner, writer for the conservative website The Bulwark, Tim Miller, had this take on the two parties after the Ohio primaries. Quote, for the second time in a year, Chantel Brown has demolished Nina Turner, extending mainstream Democrats' winning streak over the progressive left. Meanwhile, twice impeached Donald Trump's endorsement-powered J.D. Vance, an insurrectionist who recently argued an authoritarian POTUS should ignore <clears throat> the Supreme Court and said he doesn't care what happens to Ukrainians, to the Senate. Nam, uh, the parties are not the same. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, Amy, um, uh, talk about what happened last night. Uh, how did uh, Vance win in Ohio? Well, he had the benefit of a really fluid field. First of all, this was there were a lot of candidates, as you noted, and nobody really got much traction in this race, even though candidates spent a lot of money. I think it was something like $60 million spent on television. Donald Trump coming in at the last minute, giving uh, J.D. Vance enough of a bump to get up over the top. As you saw, he didn't win a majority of the vote, but he got, what, something like 30 percent of the vote. It was enough to get him into first place. What's interesting to me is not just that the Donald Trump candidate won. It's that the Rob Portman endorsed candidate came, I think, in fourth, very far back of the pack. Um, it wasn't that long ago, uh, you all, that um, Rob Portman won in Ohio. He won in 2016, outperforming Trump by seven points in that race. Wasn't that long ago, 2016, that John Kasich easily won the primary in Ohio. Those kinds of candidates, they're just, they're no longer there anymore. Donald Trump's party is now the party in Ohio, and it's a party across the country. And, you know, we look so much at, at states like Florida, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio. There's been such a sea change in Ohio. And you look at the results coming in last night. Boy, in the rural areas, Trump's word in Ohio still gold. I mean, it, it, it made all the difference in the world for J.D. Vance. Trump still has a massive sway over uh, uh, perhaps it's a small base of support in the Republican Party, but whatever it is, it's certainly the more rural, uh, the better J.D. Vance did because of that Trump endorsement. Now, J.D. Vance, the venture capitalist uh, turned Midwest memoirist, was once extremely against Trump before he was for him, tweeted things uh, about how much he loved Mitt Romney taking down Donald Trump. He'd go on Charlie Rose, he'd write for the New York Times. I think they profiled him on 60 Minutes. He was just, he really was, was the, star. he was the elite's elite. He was, of course, mm -hmm. an Ivy Leaguer. All these guys are Ivy so Leaguers impressive. these days, aren't they? Roll Tide. Thank God I went to Alabama and Florida. <laughs> uh, but all these guys are Ivy Leaguers these days, it seems. A venture capitalist, a guy from Silicon Valley, they're talking about how grand Silicon Valley was until he left Silicon Valley with all of his money. Uh, well, MSNBC's Ari Melber showcased some of Vance's, well, de devolution or evolution, whichever way you want to look at it. 
But as somebody who doesn't like Trump myself, the elites were right about Donald Trump, right? I'm a never Trump guy. I never liked him. He's the best president of my lifetime, and he revealed the corruption in this country like nobody else. I can't stomach Trump. I think that he's noxious and is leading the white working class to a very dark place. I think that he was a good president. I think he made a lot of good decisions for people. I take it you're not a Trump supporter from what I've read. Am I right? Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't vote for Trump. All around, he was a great president. I'm 37 years old. Certainly the best president of my lifetime. Consider how Vance's professional bio is basically a hit list for today's right-wing grievance culture. He was a coastal banker and a venture capitalist, an Ivy League elite from Yale Law School, a self-styled literary intellectual who mused about the dangers of right-wing extremism in magazines like The Atlantic. And then, I'm out of fingers on this hand, and then he pursued a perch within the coastal media elite pushing a trendy book where he claimed to explain the Rust Belt in the Midwest while writing from the coasts, and then taking that tome, Hillbilly Elegy, to go spend as much time as he could talking to his fellow media elites about what were his coastal observations about the troubled rest of the nation. Vance also deleted his old tweets that Sam slammed Trump as, quote, reprehensible, and arguing that God wants better for America than Trump cultural outsider. I didn't come from the elites. I didn't come from the Northeast or from San Francisco. You are out in San Francisco now, right? That's right. Working for Peter Thiel? Uh, yeah, I work, work at one of the venture capital funds that he co-founded. The things that I care most about are not in San Francisco. They're not in Silicon Valley. One thing led to another, and I found myself in Silicon Valley. If you think about the folks who are really you know, building the future, building really great and cool companies, and I just wanted to be involved in that. He's a Yale-educated lawyer, a great student, you know, went to Yale, got a law degree. And I do think that basic human honesty, even though it may not always pay off in the short term, it tends to pay off in the long term, or at least if you're not honest, it tends to pay off negatively in the long term. I'm sick of the big tech companies censoring conservatives, shutting us up, and let's be honest, ladies and gentlemen, stealing the 2020 election. So, it's all on tape. It's all there. He's a hypocrite. He lies. All, all, all of that. Yeah. But it turned out last night it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Donald Trump endorsed him. He apologized for the things he said about Donald Trump. Donald Trump said, look, if I held everybody who said something mean about me responsible for it, I wouldn't have any friends or I wouldn't have any allies in politics. It didn't matter in the end. As long as he pledged allegiance to Donald Trump right before the end, his poll numbers went up. He was down by 10 points. Last night, he won by nine points. Let's, let's just, first of all, let's say that there is a, there's a nice consistency to this because it turns out that there are two audiences where it doesn't matter uh, being a t having a total flip-flop from hating Donald Trump to loving Donald Trump. The first audience is Donald Trump. Trump right. doesn't care. Right. He, he, he forgives everybody as long as they come around to him at the right moment and, and genuflect in the right way and kiss the ring. He will. He gives everyone a, a day pass. There's, he doesn't hold grudges. And so, because he wants to, if he thinks he has a winner, he wants to be able to bestow that blessing and then claim credit. And in this case, the other people who don't care are Trump voters. So it's like Trump doesn't care about apostasy of that kind and neither do the voters. And Trump knows that. And I, again, I give him credit in this one sense. You know, he put he put his he put his his imprimatur on the line here and said, you know, I'm going to show everybody there were skeptics, including me, who were like, I don't know, it doesn't seem like it seems like J.D. Vance is getting a, ri a rise out of this, but not necessarily enough. It turned out that late tailwind was stronger than you'd seen in any of the polling uh, in the days leading up to the race. As Amy pointed out, the race was really fluid. There were a bunch of Republicans in the race, and even at the end, three or four who could conceivably have won last night. And, and he didn't, it wasn't even close last night. This is yeah. a, you know, this is a, he puts, he's got a, almost a 10 point uh, victory here over, uh, over, over Josh Mandel, and who was like a, easily the front runner in this field until the day that Donald Trump endorsed J.D. Vance. So, you know, Donald Trump ha actually, I mean, as painful as it is for you to say, at least, that you're on Ted Cruz's side about anything, I, it, it, I, I, I feel the bitter bile rising in my throat when I say Donald Trump will brag about this today. Sure. And in the limited sense that, you know, he, in the limited sense that he, he demonstrated that he still has an enormous power over his own party and their primary electorate, he'll be right. He has bragging rights on this today. But I'll also say this. You know, this is a candidate who, you know, it, it, Ohio is becoming increasingly red in presidential elections. It's not, it's really not, a, almost not a swing state anymore. But in, you know, Jared Gret Brown proves that a certain kind of Democrat can win. He's won three times, including your race against Josh Mandel back in 2012. 
this this is the kind of candidate that Tim Ryan can beat. If you look at the Sherrod Brown playbook over the course of three consecutive victories, that's the kind of matchup, blue collar Democrat against a kind of extremist Republican. Mm -hmm. That still is the place where you can win in Ohio, even though the state is at the presidential level increasingly. Red John, state. We're going to talk to Tim Ryan in our next hour about how he plans to try to beat J.D. Vance. Yeah, and certainly former President Trump's endorsement record is actually far spottier than yeah. he wants to acknowledge. But he he did. He put himself out on this one. Uh, Vance was down. Trump got him over the finish line. Odds are he picks up a lot of support. Mandel also wanted you know, try to grab Trump as well, though they'll coalesce. But to John's point, that the Ohio, I mean, the Biden campaign barely played in Ohio in 2020. There aren't many Democrats who think they can do well there in 2024. But this is a race where theoretically that Trump may have backed a candidate who could potentially lose this fall. Speak to us about at least because that's a pattern we could see in Georgia, too, right? I think Donald Trump came out of the gates, his May sweepstakes of endorsements. This was a really good one for him. Then looking forward to Pennsylvania Senate, yep. what's going to happen there? Dave McCormick versus Dr. Oz. Donald Trump's gone with Dr. Oz, who is a full-fledged election denier and would be a strong ally for him in 2024, should he need that kind of backing. Then you go to Georgia. And it's different. It's a little different. In the governor's race, Brian Kemp versus David Perdue. Brian Kemp looks, according to polls, he's going to win handily. Yep. And that, you know, the Senate, the Republican Senate race down there isn't one that's even, you know, in dispute with Herschel Walker. But then you look, you can kind of pick and see, you can see the differences in where Donald Trump's endorsement actually matters. So was this an early victory that means nothing? No, I don't think so, because I do think it pushed him over the edge. And you're going to see, and you look in Pennsylvania, it's very likely could push Dr. Oz over the edge, too in places where a local leader has already established their track record, it's going to be harder for Trump to have some impact.